Chapter Three of The Man Who Fought the Devil by Eva K. Betts. Chapter Three. Jean Marie, come and play quoits with us. We'll beat you this time, Jean Marie. You never have, so why should you expect to this evening? Because, come on, Jean Marie. The day of hoeing in the vineyard had been long and hot, and Jean Marie was very tired, but he did enjoy playing quoits with the other boys. It was the only game of skill he played, and he was very good at it, so good that he invariably won. Wait until I put my tools away. It was the custom in Dardilly to play for stakes, a custom which Jean Marie didn't like. Let's play just for the fun of it this evening, he suggested. It's so long since I've played. I'm rusty. We'll call this a practice game for me. But his hopes for an unstaked game were not to be gratified. No, no, here's my red top. I'll wager that. I have two suit my uncle gave me. Here is a knife. The blade is broken, but the half that's there cuts very well. As each boy laid his treasure on the little heap, Jean-Marie's heart sank lower. The boys had few possessions, and he knew what the outcome of the game would be. But he started to play, and, as always, he did the best he could. It would not have occurred to him to play this honestly, even though it would be playing to lose. One by one his competitors were beaten. He was the undisputed winner. Unhappily he walked homeward carrying the winnings he did not want. All during supper his mind was absorbed with the problem of how to get the things back to the boys. Simply to return them would, he felt, insult the former owners who had wagered them and lost. But they can't refuse presents, he suddenly decided. No one is so rude as to refuse a gift. Delighted with the idea, he could hardly wait for the evening meal to be finished. When he had done his part toward the cleaning up afterward, he ran to his mother. I have some errands to do, mother, he said, hoping she would not inquire what they were. I'll be back very quickly, but I must go now. Mrs. Vianney opened her mouth, as if to ask where he was going, but decided against the question, and simply said, Run along. So Jean-Marie ran first to one house, then the next. I have a present for you, Thomas. A present? Yes, I heard you needed a knife. I have two, so I brought one to you. The blade is broken, but what is left cuts well. His eyes were cast down, so if there was a twinkle in them when he described the knife, it didn't show. But that's not. This is a present, Thomas, said Jean-Marie firmly. The boy was torn by conflicting desires. Politeness was esteemed in Dardilly and politeness taught that one didn't refuse a gift, and he did want the knife. But he had no wish to be considered a poor loser either, yet Jean-Marie was insistent. Well, all right, Thomas said gruffly, if it's a present. It's a present, Jean-Marie assured him. And so one boy after another got back what he had lost. Much happier, Jean-Marie ran home. I like to play quoits, he thought, but I must see if I can't get them to play without stakes. I really can't run around the village this way every night. By the following year, 1800, Napoleon Bonaparte was first consul of France. Austria had once more taken the field against him, but his army defeated the Austrian soldiers in several important engagements, and in 1801 Austria was glad to sign a peace treaty with Bonaparte. This man seemed to be blessed with great military genius combining with amazing luck. Other nations with which France had been warring followed the lead of Austria. From each, Napoleon collected tribute in the way of money or lands. In a few short years, he had changed the map of Europe. Inside France itself, conditions were bad. There had been waste and destruction during the Reign of Terror. There had been waste and extravagance in the years which followed. Now the country was almost bankrupt, and, what was worse, the people were so depressed that they did not seem to care. Our roads are dilapidated. Our harbors are filled with sand, so that ships are afraid to come into them with trade, Napoleon's counselors told him. We will rebuild the roads and clear the harbors, he replied. Our industries are nearly dead. No one can afford to buy lace or linen or silk any longer. The government will set them on their feet. The government has no money. Few people pay their taxes, and what little income there is goes to the army. Taxes will be collected from all who owe them, rolled Napoleon. The people are resentful and unhappy. Free all priests from jail, that may please the people, and where churches still stand, let them be opened again. 
By 1800, a few of the priests who had been exiled had begun slipping back to their old parishes and taking up their duties, unofficially, though, more or less openly. In 1801, Napoleon signed an agreement with the Vatican, returning some of the church lands, which had been taken. He still claimed the right to appoint bishops, but at least the churches could be opened again. Father Grabose and Father Bailey were already established in Eccoli. As soon as it was safe, they began to paint and repair the church to get it ready for the parishioners once more. In 1802, Father Ray reopened the little church at Dardilly. Jean-Marie was one of his first volunteer assistants. Jean-Marie could read fairly well, and he loved to read the Bible. One day, working in the vineyards, he mentioned the miracle of Cana to some of the lads who were helping Mr. Vianney with the vines. What's a miracle? Where is Cana? Jean-Marie was somewhat startled by the questions. He tried to explain, but found the boys uncomprehending and very soon uninterested. Oh, if it's all about God, don't bother, said one. Jean-Marie was aghast. Don't you like to think about God? What's there to think about? I suppose there is a God, but... Stop! Don't talk that way! This was not the last time Jean-Marie was distressed almost beyond endurance. As the days passed, he realized more and more that many of the boys knew little and cared less about their creator. If I only had some more schooling, he thought, I could teach them. Some day I might even become a priest. He, a priest? He grunted, dismissing the idea. There is no use thinking of anything like that. I'm a peasant farmer, and a farmer I must continue to be. The idea had come to his mind, however, and no matter how much he tried to argue it away, it would not leave. He read his Bible and the imitation of Christ, and wished that he had more time for prayer. Then he reasoned out a solution. When I'm working in the fields, he decided, I can be working with God. I'll do the sowing and the weeding, but he will be blessing it. When it's hard, I'll offer up the blisters on my hands. When it's cold, I'll offer up my shivers. And so it went on for a few years. But at last, at seventeen, he could not stand the pressure of the great idea any longer. I am sure God wants me to be a priest, he told Father Ray. What should I do? You have had very little schooling, the priest said doubtfully. You can read? Quite well, Father, Jean-Marie answered happily. And write? Not too well. There was less joy in his voice now. Have you had Latin? No, Father. No Latin at all, nor Greek either, I suppose. Most boys who wish to study for the priesthood are well on in both languages by the time they are your age. Jean-Marie's heart sank. Then he brightened up a bit. Father, couldn't you teach me some of these things? I would work so hard. I'm sure you would, Jean-Marie, the priest smiled sadly but I'll tell you a secret. I may not be here much longer. At the desolate look on Jean-Marie's face, the old man hurried on. Oh, I'm not preparing to die, or not any more than we should always be preparing at any rate. But my years as a hundred priests have taken their toll of my strength. I am sick and unable to do the work which should be done in the parish, so I have asked to be relieved. Jean-Marie left the house disheartened. He almost wept when he told his mother of his conversation with Father Ray. I have often thought you had a vocation, said Mrs. Vianney, but don't mention it to your father now. You would need more education before you could study for the priesthood, and an education would cost money. Just now your father is having a hard time raising money for your sister Catherine's dowry. So Jean-Marie kept silent, hoping that after his sister's marriage his own chance would come. But when he did at last mention it to his father, Mr. Vianney would not hear of it. Jean-Marie was too old, he argued. Jean-Marie was a good farmer, a fine, steady workman. Couldn't he serve God and save his soul while working on the farm? An education was very expensive, and he had no money. However, he soon had to find some money for another purpose. Frankles was constricted into the army, and his father had to find and pay a substitute to take his place, as was often done at that time. Another year went by. Daily, Mr. Vianney beheld the pleading eyes of his son, and knew the special intention of his wife's prayers. Mr. Vianney gave in. All right, you will have no peace, nor will I, I suppose, until you find out if you really have a vocation. We'll find the money somehow, but where will you go to study? That was indeed a question. I understand that Father Bailey has classes for boys at Eccoli, said Mrs. Vianney hesitantly, 
Perhaps I can go in and talk with him. I want to go with you, mother. He must see what a big, clumsy lout I am before he commits himself. Big, perhaps, smiled his mother, but to the clumsy lout I can't agree. When Jules Marie and his mother reached Eccoli, they went at once to the rectory. Mrs. Vianney entered the house to talk to Father Bailey. Jules Marie waited outside in an agony of alternating hope and despair. Indoors, Mrs. Vianney suffered from the same emotions. We need priests, yes, Father Bailey said kindly. But your son, you say he is nineteen. Yes, Father. That in itself would be a difficulty, but when we add to the fact that he is late beginning specialized subjects, the further fact that little or no schooling has gone before, I don't see how it can be managed. But he is such a good boy, and he wants so much to become a priest. I know, and I am very sorry, but you see, I have classes of boys who are already well advanced in Latin. I do not see how I could take him. He would not fit in anywhere. Mrs. V. Annie twisted her handkerchief between her fingers unhappily. I don't know how I can tell him. He has waited so long, she sighed deeply. Father, may I ask a favor? Certainly. Will you see Jean-Marie? Talk with him? Tell him? There was silence for a moment. Yes, bring the boy in. I will try to make him understand and accept the situation. Perhaps I can suggest something. His mother opened the door and beckoned to Jean-Marie, who came running. She watched as he came, with tears in her eyes. He is so thin, she thought. He has prayed so hard about this. I hope Father Bailey will be gentle in explaining. The boy, his thin arms much too long for the sleeves of the jacket which barely spanned his chest, was panting not from the running but from excitement. This was the moment he had wished for, worked for, prayed for, so long. Today he would take his first step toward the priesthood. "'Shall I let him go in after all?' asked his mother. His mother wondered when she saw his eager face. "'Shall I let him go in, or shall I tell him myself?' The decision was taken out of her hands by Jean Marie, who moved swiftly around her and into Father Bailey's little office. You sent for me, Father? The priest looked up, studying the eager, ascetic young face with his burning eyes. He started to speak, hesitated, studied the boy a moment longer. Then he smiled. Yes, Jean Marie, I wanted to tell you that I will be glad to take you as a student. And so it was that Jean Marie went back to Eccoli to live and study. The months which followed would have discouraged completely any less determined person. At nineteen, Jean-Marie was in a class of eleven and twelve-year-olds, and even so was far from the brightest in the class. And the children, not meaning to be unkind, couldn't help but laugh when the man, as they called him, stuttered and stumbled over answers they could give with ease. It's my memory, or rather my lack of it, Jean-Marie would groan. I know the lessons when I am studying them, but when it comes time to recite, the thoughts fly from my mind like birds from a cat. I just have no memory at all. He worked and prayed with equal intensity. There were moments when he lost all courage, but he always found it again. The people of Eccoli grew to love this quiet, intense lad who worked so determinedly to reach his goal. Then, in 1809, a new problem faced Jean Marie. End of Chapter 3 Recording by Maria Therese